constantly working in Bangkok, a city that epitomizes hard work, the entrepreneurial spirit, and tough competition. Businesses are everywhere, and everywhere people have carved out a niche for themselves. Just a few doors down from this small business is another type of industry. Behind this nondescript facade is a bustling Muay Thai boxing school, a place where some of the best fighters in Thailand train, learn, and live together in a positive communal environment, a lifestyle that meets with mixed reviews depending on who you speak with. It's a good life, easy life. Different uh, mentality from Europe and Thailand. You sleep on the floor. You, you know, some, uh, at, at the night, you know, when you're sleeping, you should sleep with the sock because when the camp where I was, you know, the rat would come and like, your finger in your... And uh, I was, uh, in the morning, I wake up and I, I feel like pain, you know, I touch. And, uh, and the Thai people say, uh, of course you... Oh, well, the rat was biting your yeah, toes. Yeah, when you're sleeping. Conditions such as these tend to motivate a fighter. In fact, those just starting out are given the more modest accommodations. Only when they gain experience and success do they garner the more upscale quarters. In both cases, the school backs each fighter equally in the ring. In fact, at each fight, it is common to find 15 to 20 people in the corner, all shouting different encouragement and advice. It is this frenzied atmosphere from both teammates and fans which boosts a fighter's spirit. It makes me happy, and it, it makes me very excited when the crowd when the crowd are cheering, and it makes me fight a lot harder. To each his own on the tough streets of Bangkok. Life here is hard in any business you choose, but for a Muay Thai fighter set on championships, this is a corner office with a view. That will do it for this edition of Strike Force. Special thanks go out to the Tawana Ramada Hotel and to Philip Wong and his Fairtex Muay Thai camp in Chandler, Arizona. For Mike Sawyer, I'm Lon McCarran. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Shot to the body, but uh, 
You know, Dan, the one compliment you don't want anybody to say about you as a fighter, man, that Dan can take a punch. Uh -huh. That's the one compliment you don't want him to say. Exactly. Yeah. Lawrence Dean can definitely take one to the body. We've seen that. that look at those elbows are in down that now. Yes. That means yeah. there was elbows in. There could be a little damage in there. Kind of knows he's been leaving his head a lot more exposed, but he is, like you said, he's down. He is a brain drop of those elbows down, cover those ribs. That could mean something. Here comes Hornstein again, the attacker, the aggressor. A knee to the midsection. Hornstein is definitely looking for uh, a number throw action taking place. A lot of spinning, tight spinning. There he goes. And Hornstein definitely looking forward to grabbing those gloves because he has told me he gets stronger as the fight goes on. We saw him in the Team USA Cheetah Con tournament really come out like gangbusters the last couple rounds, and now they do go to the gloves. Ten out gloves coming on. It'll make it for an interesting match now. Dan, we talked about the knees, but going high with the knees versus trying to bring the fighter down to you. And if you try to go upstairs, you've got to be very leery of the fact that uh, you could get yourself in trouble rather than bringing the opponent down. So that's something that we've got to watch for. Well, that actually happened to Hornstein at one point in time. Right. He did not bring his opponent down to him, and he just stepped straight into him, and the Hornstein ended up on his own back out there. Shuji getting cowed off. I'm here. anticipating Hornstein just step right up here for a lot of action once these 10-ounce gloves come on. Here's that knee that we talked about. Yeah, right, he's trying to the, go to the head, but he, he does not bring the, the head down. He needs to bring that head down, and it meets the knee, and then it doesn't damage. I say watch Hornstein here the first couple of seconds to see if he sets the tone with the 10-ounce gloves. I think the hands will be coming back up again there, Bruce, yeah. and uh, he'll, be, he'll be delivering the strikes now. Hard <laughs> side shot for the body, goes back upstairs to the head. Missing wildly. Good recovery, though. Knockout by Shuji. Shuji just showed this uh, 101 warrior out there. 
You can't predict what he found. No. Well, he said that Shuji had some experience as a New South Karate tournament winner and a kickboxing winner, but to explosively put away of a veteran such as Mo Tai Horenstein, wow. So Shuji has a date with Tuha Jeffsky in the final. Dan the Beach Severin, thanks for joining us. It's been a pleasure. We'll look forward to seeing you down the road. Thank you again there, Bruce and Don. Here we go, the finals in the lightweight division. Jerry Morris taking on Mohamed Farsi. Nine rounds in the final, if necessary. And here's the tale of the tape. Morris is the veteran, eight years older than Farsi. He's got a three-inch height advantage and tips the scales four pounds heavier than his opponent. It's St. Martin versus France. Three two-minute rounds, Kumite rules, three two-minute rounds, side boxing rules, three two-minute rounds, wrestling and submission rules. Morris coming off the fourth round K over Sidney Coney, and Farsi with the second round TK over Pat White. I remember it was very controversial with White, and we knew that White was uh, a little worse for the wear and tear from a previous bout. Not taking away from Farsi, he did a good job. 